Hello again. Most people in Britain had never heard of institutional racism before the Macpherson report about the murder of Stephen Lawrence was published in 1999. Since then, it's become a popular catchphrase, bandied about at every touch and turn. Because it is connected with black people, an awful lot of white people are nervous of challenging the idea of institutional racism, even if they don't really understand what the term signifies. Institutional racism is not a new idea. The first people to talk of it were the American black power militants in the late 1960s. People like Stokely Carmichael, of course, and Angela Davis. For the next 30 years or so, it was regarded by most sociologists and mainstream thinkers as a bit mad, something like a conspiracy theory. In 1986, Britain's Open University published a book called Race and Ethnicity by a professor called John Rex. <coughs> he wrote scathingly of the concept of institutional racism, heading a chapter, The Problem of Institutional Racism. He meant by this, by this that the idea was the problem, not the thing itself. He found a lot of difficulties. Um, he didn't really accept that institutional racism meant anything. Today, though, we're all very careful not to upset black people or contradict anything said by a black person because we have learned to respect their lived experience. If black people say that there is such a thing and that they are victims of it, then who are we to argue? There is a slight difficulty here, and that is that ethnic minorities, not only in Britain and the United States, but in um, countries like the Netherlands as well, are more prone to believing in conspiracy theories and urban myths than the majority of white people. I give in the description to this video links to a couple of studies on this point. We remember the disruption of science lessons in America when a number of black athletes and pop singers in that country declared that the earth was flat and that white science was hiding this important fact. Many black students believed their idols without question and began arguing with teachers during lessons about the solar system, hinting that the idea that the earth was round was something dreamed up by white people. As indeed it was, thank goodness. So it is that institutional racism has been enthusiastically embraced as an explanation for everything wrong in the lives of black people in Britain. This includes uh, educational underachievement, health problems, employment and trouble with the police, to give four examples. This is where conspiracy theories come into their own, by providing a simple explanation for complex problems. So we are told that the National Health Service is institutionally racist because of the number of black and Asian babies which are stillborn, the number of black mothers who die in pregnancy, lower life expectancy for black and Asian people, and many other things. Of course, the fact that black women are statistically more likely to be obese sheds light on deaths from many causes, ranging from diabetes to COVID. It also tells us that difficulties in pregnancy and giving birth will be more likely. The unfortunate fact that 50% of women of Pakistani and Bangladeshi heritage in Britain marry cousins, as against 1 in 25,000 white people, indicates too that stillbirths and premature death and having children with disabilities are likely to be associated with genetic defects caused by this, rather than racism in the NHS. I give a reference to a study on this subject published in the British Medical Journal in the description to this video. The educational system in Britain is not racist, quite the opposite. 
schools, local authorities and individual teachers all bend over backward to accommodate the needs of ethnic minorities, especially black children. The fact that A-level results are better for Indians and Chinese students than they are from those from African and Caribbean families is regrettable, but has nothing to do with racism, institutional or otherwise. This um, deficit in A-level qualifications has a knock-on effect when it comes to employment because black students, not having the best A-levels, tend to go to poorly performing universities. And when they are there, they often study subjects which are not highly regarded by potential employers. Racism does not enter into it. As for the fact that a higher proportion of black people end up in prison than white, there might be many explanations for such a state of affairs. There's not a large black middle class uh, in this country, and class has a lot to do with the likelihood of ending up in prison, as does the area in which one grows up and goes to school. It may be that black people, young men in particular, commit a disproportionately high number of, of offences compared with white Jews, and that the crimes are of a different nature or perhaps severity. All this would explain things easily without having to invoke the spectre of institutional racism. There can be no doubt that an awful lot of black people believe in institutional racism and that many white people pay lip service to the notion because they are eager uh, not to appear racist themselves generally. This tells us nothing though about the objective existence of such a thing. As it is currently used and spoken of, institutional racism still has the same characteristics of a conspiracy theory which it had in the 1970s and 1980s. When close examination is made of the situations where it supposedly operates, no trace can be found, and all that is observed can be more readily explained by other factors unrelated to racial prejudice. In short, it is an unnecessary hypothesis. We can well see why the idea has become so very popular, among black people in particular. It means that rather than examining their lives, behaviour and belief systems, they are enabled to pass off the consequences of their actions onto others. The number of black youths being murdered in Britain by other black youths is utterly appalling. And many people think that the reason for this slow motion massacre are to be found in the communities themselves. Family structure, attitudes to authority, role models, educational aspiration and a dozen other things. This would require some very hard thought and self-examination. Far easier to blame racist society for such evils. The same thing applies to the shocking number of stillbirths and children born with dreadful disabilities to families who have their origin in Muslim parts of the Indian subcontinent. There too, difficult questions might be asked about the wisdom of cousin marriages and so on. Once again, it is simpler to say that the National Health Service is institutionally racist and the problem is then removed from their community and becomes instead something for the majority white population to address. I am not, and I've said this many times before, a fan of conspiracy theories, and I'm no keener on this one than any other. The remedy for many of the ills suffered by some minority communities in Britain lies largely in their own hands, and I refuse to take responsibility for such things as cousin marriages among Pakistani Muslims, and communal violence within the African and Caribbean communities. These things are not a product of institutional racism at all, but have other causes. <laughs>